Okay, so we're going to begin by talking a little bit about standing wave ratio. Actually, we're going to talk a lot about it. Anyhow, when we talk about understanding the basics for the amateur radio operator, understanding standing wave ratio, SWR, sometimes you'll see it referred to as VSWR, is essential for optimizing station performance. While SWR is often viewed as a key metric for antenna health, misconceptions abound. A low SWR isn't a guaranteed hallmark of efficiency, and a high SWR isn't always catastrophic. We're going to talk through this. This discussion aims to clarify what SWR represents, dispel common myths, and delve deeper into the concept of conjugate matching, and explore the role of antenna tuners. We'll also compare common tuner topologies, T, Pi, and L networks, and we'll discuss feed line considerations in more depth so you can make informed decisions when refining your station setup. Looking to elevate your amateur radio experience? Join the American Radio Relay League, the ultimate community for ham radio enthusiasts. By joining the ARRL, you will get access to educational resources to build your knowledge, exclusive publications, and opportunities to engage in public service. As a member, you'll enjoy access to four digital magazines. Take a deep dive with QST and build your skills. If not the ARRL, then who? We're the ones protecting the ham radio spectrum in Washington, D.C., ensuring our voices are heard. Use code APE1 for a free hydration pack with a one- or three-year subscription. So a simple explanation for SWR is that it measures how well your load, your antenna and feed line, matches the transmitter's output impedance, normally 50 ohms. When a transmitter sends RF energy down the feed line to the antenna, a perfect impedance match results in nearly all of that energy being radiated. If the load impedance differs from the line's characteristic impedance, that's your transmission line or coax cable, some energy is reflected back, creating standing waves and raising SWR. A one-to-one -one SWR indicates a perfect match with virtually no reflected power. A two-to-one SWR suggests some mismatch but is often acceptable. A very high SWR signals a large mismatch, potentially reducing transmitter efficiency and, in extreme cases, risking damage to unprotected equipment. So I want to talk a little bit about some common misunderstandings about SWR and separate a little fact from fiction. SWR versus efficiency. A perfect SWR does not guarantee an efficient antenna system. Consider a dummy load. It yields a one-to-one -one SWR, yet radiates little to no signal. Conversely, a higher SWR on a well-designed antenna can deliver strong performance on the air. SWR is just one factor in antenna design. Height, environment, and conductor quality all influence actual radiation efficiency. High SWR isn't always fi fatal. Modern radios often include SWR protection circuitry. While an extremely high SWR can stress older gear or cause modern rigs to reduce power output, moderate SWR 2 to 1 or even 3 to 1 is usually tolerable. Your goal should be a manageable SWR, not necessarily an absolute minimum. All of that being said, uh, if my SWR is around 1.5 to 1, I'm not going to bother using the tuner. I'm going to run it and bypass. If my SWR is 2 to 1, I am going to try to tune that down to 1.5 to 1. Now, here's the thing. Antenna tuners don't fix your antenna. They really don't do anything to your antenna. An antenna tuner adjusts the impedance at the radio end of the feed line, if that's where your tuner is, giving the transmitter a near 50 ohm load. However, it does not change the antenna's inherent characteristics, and that's why I maintain it doesn't tune your antenna. It matches your antenna. High SWR may still exist along the feed line, causing added losses. The tuner simply masks the mismatch from the transmitter's perspective. So I want to talk a little bit about conjugate matching and maximum power transfer. And this is where it starts to sound complex, but it's really not if we talk through it. Conjugate matching is a key principle in RF theory. It's an ideal scenario. Maximum power transfers occurs when the load and impedance is the complex conjugate of the source impedance, meaning if the transmitter's impedance is ZS, so Z is the symbol for impedance, S means source, source impedance, is equal to your real resistance, R, and then that S is at the source, plus JX, your reactance, S is at the source. The load should be ZL, that's the L's for load, should be equal to RS minus 
JX. So by canceling out reactive components, you enable the transmitter to deliver its full available power without reflections into the radio. You do have some reflections on your transmission line, but the conjugate match takes care of that. So basically what it's saying for conjugate matching, and this is the only part you really need to remember, is that it is a mirror image of the antenna's input impedance. That's it. So a little bit more. Theory versus reality. Achieving a perfect conjugate match at every frequency is challenging. Antennas are frequently frequency dependent. So while you may get close to a perfect match at resonance, changing bands or frequencies alters the antenna's impedance. Let's talk a little bit about the role of matching networks. Antenna tuners and other matching networks approximate a conjugate match by adjusting inductors and capacitors. So the transmitter sees a near 50 ohm resistive load. Although the feed line and antenna still might present high SWR beyond the tuner and the transmitter um, is effectively happy. So it's delivering all of the power into the tuner and then the tuner is delivering what it can into the transmission line. So there's some limitations and practical considerations. Even with a near conjugate match, feed line loss and antenna inefficiency still matter. We talked a little bit earlier about antenna construction and mounting things that play a role. The best results come from balancing theory with practicality. Use a good antenna design, proper feed line, and a tuner for fine tuning rather than relying solely on matching networks to fix poor choices elsewhere in the system. So we'll talk a little bit about feed line. And everybody always says, well, what should I use? What's the best coax that I could buy? And different coax has different price points, different characteristics, and different performance. And you should pick what's appropriate to you, and that can be overwhelming at first. What I would do is I would explain your setup to somebody with a little bit more experience and hopefully they give you a good answer without an affiliate link. So anyhow, understanding your feed line loss, the choice of feed line is crucial to ensuring that the maximum amount of power reaches your antenna. Feed line losses can tax both your transmitted and received signals. When SWR is high, these losses compound because the RF energy may traverse the line multiple times, forward and reflected power. All feed lines have inherent attenuation often increasing with frequency. At HF, losses might be modest, but at VHF, UHF, they become significant. High SWR exacerbates these losses since both forward and reflective waves experience attenuation. Even if you achieve a good match at the tuner, multiple passes of signal along the lossy line can reduce net radiated power. And this concept seems to escape some certain folks when they talk about SWR being high and trying to explain that it doesn't cause any loss. Technically, the SWR doesn't cause any loss, but the signal traversing on your less than optimal coaxial cable suffers attenuation and that is loss. So I use coaxial cable because it's easy and it's convenient and it's 50 ohm coaxial cable and we have common and convenient, but it can have noticeable losses at higher frequencies with very long runs. Smaller diameter coaxial types like RG58 have more loss than larger ones like RG213 and LMR400. Under high SWR conditions, these losses become more pronounced. A lot of folks use open wire or ladder line, and God bless them. I don't. It seems like it's going to be a difficult thing for me to pull off, but maybe I'm just being lazy. Anyhow, it offers significantly lower loss, especially at HF, and performs far better under high SWR conditions. This makes ladder line ideal for multi-band non-resonant antennas fed through a tuner. The main drawback is that the ladder line must be kept away from conductive surfaces and often requires a ballon at the tuner interface, which isn't the end of the world. What we can do is minimize losses with smart choices. Keep your feed line short. The shorter the run, the lower the total loss. Use high quality, low loss cable. Now, LMR 400 can be a good investment, especially at higher frequencies or longer lengths, but I really don't, don't think that's the way to go. I would buy a decent cable from a decent, reputable salesperson. Not, I wouldn't just buy generic stuff off of Amazon or eBay. You don't know what you're going to get. And I would buy a little bit of cable from them at first and work with it. And if I like it, I would buy more. And if I didn't, I would buy something somewhere else. Consider your frequency and bandwidth. If you operate primarily on HF and you use non-resonant multiband antennas, ladder line plus a tuner can greatly improve efficiency despite varying SWR. Maintain and waterproof. Regularly expect your cables, connectors, and seals. Water ingress or corrosion increases feed line loss over time. Uh, tuner placement and feed line loss. Placing the tuner at the antenna feed point can minimize high SWR on runs of cable. 
With the tuner right at the antenna, feed line sees a match condition, reducing losses. While not always practical, this approach can significantly improve system efficiency. I know a few hams who do this, and they swear by it. I keep my tuner in the shack. I have not put one at the antenna feed point. That doesn't mean I won't ever do it. I just haven't done it yet. So a practical example, a 100-foot run of high-loss coax at HF with a 3-to-1 SWR might lose over half of the transmitted power by the time it reaches the antenna. Upgrading to lower loss coax or switching to ladder line can drastically reduce, reduce these losses. Even at higher SWR, the reduced attenuation of better feed line preserves more of your transferred energy. So a lot of people think that antenna tuners make all this go away, and they certainly help. And let's talk a little bit about them and what you should use. So in terms of function and purpose, tuners are impedance transformers. Some people call them match boxes. Some people call them ATUs. People call them all kinds of stuff. Um, they use variable inductors and capacitors to offset the load's reactive components, presenting a near 50 ohm load to the transmitter. This prevents fold back pow power foldback and ensures maximum available power transfer from the rig to the tuner's output. And so what we want to do as hams is, is that we want to get as much power out of our radio and into our load. In this case, it's an antenna. And we want to do that as efficiently as possible. And things like SWR mess that up. And things like lossy coax mess that up. So what we do is we go through a balancing act, finding out what is an appropriate SWR, how I can achieve that potentially with using a tuner, either at the antenna feed point or at my shack, Combine that with reasonably low loss transmission line, whether it's ladder line or something else, coaxial cable, and then uh, work with something that I consider acceptable. In terms of tuners, we have internal, we have external, we have manual, and we have automatic. Internal tuners are convenient but limited in their impedance range. Typically with most modern radios, these are 3 to 1. There are some examples of radios still in the market have a 10 to 1 tuning ratio. External tuners offer greater flexibility and handle wider ranges at higher power levels. Uh, manual tuners are cost-effective and educational, although they do require a little bit of operator skill to adjust. And then auto automatic tuners are quick and convenient, ideal for frequent band changes. The thing with um, automatic tuners is, is that sometimes you have to be aware of their power output um, levels and what is appropriate for that tuner, especially if you're doing things like digital modes. So these antenna tuners commonly use T, Pi, or L networks, and I have videos that go into each one of these in more depth, and antenna tuners in more depth, if that's something you're interested in reviewing. But each one of these networks has unique characteristics. So T networks, uh, they have a very wide matching range, common and well documented. They have higher losses at extreme mismatches and potentially large circulating currents. So you can use them, they work, but you want to consider that stuff. Pi network tuners uh, have a moderate matching range, and they do have some harmonic suppression. Uh, they are more complex. When I talk about harmonic suppression, I talk about any harmonics that are out of band for your transmitted fundamental frequency. Pi network tuners can sometimes suppress those in the event that they're problematic. Cons, uh, they're a little bit more complex to adjust and often require larger components for higher power. L-network tuners uh, are very popular, uh, simple, efficient, minimal component count, great for single band or nearly resonant antennas. They do have a limited matching range without switching or multiple networks. Now, what we typically see in almost all uh, tuners that we buy are T-networks, and that's uh, because they're super duper popular for the reasons listed here. So I have choosing the right network, maximal flexibility to your Pi networks, simplicity and known loads, L networks, and harmonic suppression Pi networks as a middle ground. So just a few practical tips to optimize your system. You start with a plan and start with a good antenna, aim for near residence on your primary bands to reduce tuner workload and feed line losses. Select the right feed line, use low loss coax or ladder line based on frequency, length, and operating style. This reduces the impact of SWR on your signal. Tune at lower power levels first. So you want to protect your gear by starting adjustments at low power before increasing to operating levels. And don't chase perfection unnecessarily. An SWR of 1.5 to 1 or 2 to 1 is often good enough, especially at HF. The returns from perfectionist tweaking may not justify the effort. Managing SWR effectively, understanding conjugate matching and choosing appropriate feed line, and selecting or building the right tuner for your station all contribute to improved on-air performance. Although SWR is often for the first metric operators look at, it's only one piece of a larger puzzle. 
A near ideal SWR might feel like a badge of honor, but a one-to-one -one reading doesn't guarantee that your antenna system is efficient or that you're radiating maximum signal strength. True efficiency involves a balanced approach. Start with a well-designed or well-chosen antenna, quality feed line, and aim for minimal losses. Understand that good enough SWR in the range of 1.5 to 2.1, or sorry, 2 to 1, it's usually adequate. Anyhow, conjugate matching, while theoretically optimal, can be challenging to achieve perfectly across multiple bands and frequencies. Instead, it serves as a guiding principle to help you appreciate why certain antenna and feed line configurations work better than others. By employing tuners and matching networks, you approximate this ideal condition, while allowing your transmitter to operate efficiently without folding back power. Still, the best tuner in the world won't cure a fundamentally poor antenna design or negate excessive feed line losses. And that's going to do it, folks. I appreciate everybody taking the time to watch. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions, or recommendations, go ahead and post them below, and I'll do my best to respond. Thank you.